And now we get to Romans 9 through 11, which is a big topic. It includes predestination and free will, the hardening of hearts. Of course, we got the Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh's heart there in this passage. And then really it's ongoing outreach to the Jewish community. So uh, this is the beginning of that. Here is my outline here. Uh, I want to acknowledge first Paul's puzzling language, then we'll look at Romans 9 through 11 in an out, in outline form. It is a chiasm. And, and, and then we'll look at double predestination in church history and, and its logic. And then we'll revisit what's at stake. <clears throat> if you would like, uh, I do have appendix materials. We could look at some other passages that tend to come up, uh, especially with uh, people believe in double predestination, uh, Ephesians 1, John 6, and Romans 8. So uh, let's look at this language here. So in Romans 9 through 11, Paul talks about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and the hardening of Israel's heart. And it sounds like this. Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? <laughs> okay. And then on the other side of this passage uh, in Romans 11, he talks about Israel. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Ooh, complex words. <clears throat> so what is at stake here as we look at this? Uh, well, there, there are a lot of questions that we might raise. Number one, how do we understand God's character, right? Does God cause unbelief that there is an interpretation or there, there are people who interpret it that way? God caused unbelief like Pharaoh, like Israel, or at least uh, the Israel uh, the, the leaders of Israel in the generation of Jesus and, and Paul uh, may be down to this present day. Is that what's going on? If so, then why? Does God, does God, uh, is God partly evil? Is he arbitrary? Another question we might ask is, how do we read Romans? So, you know, Romans is popular material to look through, especially for Protestants. Um. <clears throat> And, and you have this weird feeling as you go through Romans 1 through 8, like God is awesome. And then you get to Romans 9 through 11, like, I don't know how I feel about this God. <laughs> and number three, do we trust Paul's use of the Hebrew scriptures? So if we chase any of those quotations down, you might ask some serious questions like, what is Paul doing here? Is he proof texting? So we'll look at that. How do, we, number four, how do we explain Jewish unbelief, whether that's just, you know, to, to, to Christians or to other Jewish folks? Um, is there an explanation? Like, well, is that explanation, this is what God wanted? Uh, fifth, did God just use Israel and trick them? Ooh, that, that puts it bluntly, doesn't it? That, but, but on some understandings, I mean, you'd have to ask it that way. How do we interpret unbelief in general? You know, so I have unbelieving parents. Uh, is, is this applicable to them? And then how do we read scripture? And in what sense can we trust it? Because there are so many things that get highlighted here. For example, uh, you know, God wants, he desires for none to perish for all to come to Jesus. Well, really? Uh, not if this means what the high federal Calvinists say it means, and, and so on. I mean, there's just a lot of then uh, mental gymnastics that we'd have to do. So uh, I would like you to, 
to identify one of these questions that you resonate, mo uh, you know, resonate with, and and why do you think that is? Uh, in other words, what do you hope to personally get out of this time? If you could unmute yourselves and and say, or maybe there's even more questions that you would raise here. Go ahead, Carter. Um, I was just going to say, I was reading this before class, um, and I came to, like, it was like the tension, it was like the tension was building up, and then it released in verse, like, nine, nine, uh, where is it, 33, and then also it just reemphasized itself in nine eleven, where it says, but anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced, and I feel like that is, like, as I read that, I just felt like a release in myself, and, like, was just so moved, mm. and it was like, God's heart is like, hey, if you trust in him, like, you're not going to have to worry about, like, this hardening, hardening that you see over and over again. But I mean, I was just really moved by that. And I just, I, I feel like that this morning, I really feel like I read this in a way, like the Lord allowed me to see it in like such a beautiful way in, in his heart. So I was just really touched by this mm. section this morning. Wow. Okay. I, Carter, that is not the usual, uh, you know, response that I hear from people. I, I, I'm glad that reading it with, with these eyes dr draws you to these things. Um, but sure. Anyone else? I, I think um, a question that gets brought to Romans 9 to 11 sometimes is then like what is the current like church's relationship with Israel or uh, um, yeah sure that's a big one yeah thank you Ian I think the <clears throat> I kind of wish Heather was here because the how to read Romans question would uh, probably blossom into a two-hour conversation for, with with her but I think uh, I think for me, it's a really important question. It was written in a particular time to a particular people. Um, and it's helpful for us to keep that in mind. Uh, we're not going to understand the entirety of the conversation because we're not in those people. And we're not in that time. doesn't mean that it's worthless, but there's uh, a lot more to understand there than we do by simply reading it today in English in, inside our own context. Yes, yes, we that that's great. So is, is there kind of we we tend to read Romans as Paul's dogmatic statement about Christian faith in in general, right, as if this could be abstracted from removed from his time period, uh, removed from the audience. And like, this is just Christianity 101. Is that true? Right? And um, th that's a great question. And um, especially when it comes to this, we'll, we'll circle back around and say, you know, we, there, it, there is a both and there's a, of course, this had a lot of meaning. Paul wrote this with a particular intention. And if we understand that intention, it could make a big difference, would, would have made a big, di big difference in church history, sadly, because I, I don't think it was followed up well. But the um, uh, but yes, I, I think we need to pay a lot of attention to this. And maybe there are some details that we won't fully land uh, with 100% certainty on, but let's try to understand the original context. Very important. I think for me, um, I... I'm most interested in the first um, maybe bullet point um, mm -hmm. around God's character and kind of some of the implications. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of like for evangelism and how I talk about my own faith and um, how I think about my relationship to God. Sure. Thanks, Biota. <laughs> so the God's character question. Yeah, I mean... This has to do with, with, with us as well in some way. Um, 
when when I develop hardness of heart? What, how do I? How should I interpret that? What what is God doing when I? I, I might be hard of hard of hearing. All right. Well, I'm going to move forward, um, but you could chew on on these things. All right. So. Here, here is that funny feeling that we read Romans, uh, that we get when we read Romans 1 through 11. You know, you read Romans 1 through 8, and it's like, great, um, God saves people. And so we, we tend to, one way, kind of a classical Protestant evangelical way of reading it is, this is about God's mercy in Christ. But then you get to Romans 9 through 11, and he appears, or again, on this uh, interpretation where God appears to be damning people like Esau, like Esau, I hated Pharaoh's heart, I hardened, and then Israel's heart, at least partially, whether that means partially in them or partially like not all of them, but some, uh, God damned them. Is that what, is that what happened? And there is a sense of retributive justice that is read into this. Um, uh, if you roll up both of those activities into kind of a, a character statement or the person of, uh, or the, the being of God, then you get God is arbitrary. And so that's the troubling aspect of this for, for most people, if you are exposed to that interpretation. Uh, I'm gonna argue, and, and the early church argued that God is loving and missional. And so they looked at Romans 1 through 11 uh, as one continuous argument that God is offering Jesus' new humanity to all. Uh, and I'll point out some other folks nowadays who, who emphasize that very clearly. There is a wrath of God, uh, which is an activity of God's love. It's not an aspect of God, like it's not a character attribute of God. It the, the wrath of God is like the wrath of a surgeon. It's the, the love of God in action, but it's directed at the cancer in us, the sin sickness in us. It serves as love. And so God condemns sin in the flesh of Jesus, Romans 8, 3 and 6, 6, uh, or, you know, circumcision of the heart. That's what it means to be truly Jewish. These kinds of things, uh, th those would be the standout kind of uh, anchor points of what is God doing in Christ then? Uh, to demonstrate that. Well, he is uh, surgically removing the sin sickness from the humanity of Jesus and then sharing Jesus with us. So that's how God's wrath and love can fit together in this paradigm. God is not two-faced. He has one face. He is loving and missional. So uh, <clears throat> let me make a contrast, though. If, if you believe kind of on the left-hand side, or that if that's what you've been exposed to, you get the impression that who is hardened? Uh, most people, right? I mean, just looking at most of the world throughout history, you would have to say, I guess most people have not believed in Jesus explicitly. So most people have been hardened. So who does the hardening? God. God alone chooses that. The duration, it's forever. The consequences are eternal. The purpose is for eternal sorting. God saves some and damns some. That means on a character level, God is arbitrary, right? You roll up, hit the sum of those activities, understood that way, and you get God is arbitrary. And God's justice, I guess, is retributive. If you offend an infinite being, you deserve infinite punishment. That's an explanation that's given. Uh, the the other interpretation on the right-hand side of the page is this, who is hardened? Only Pharaoh and some Jews. And that, you know, put a star by that because that, um, that, that even that we'll, we'll need to look at carefully. <clears throat> who does the hardening? Human beings. And then in some sense, God reinforced it. The duration is momentary. It does not last forever, it's momentary. The consequences are historical, not eternal. The purpose is to show more mercy. In other words, God intends to save all and intends to damn no one. So again, roll that up into a character statement. God is loving and missional. 
and God's justice is restorative, which is uh, an offer of when offenders can participate in undoing the harm they've done, as in even the harm that we've done to our own human nature. Well, in Christ, we can participate in the restoration of our own human nature and the human relationships that we've damaged. So there's a big difference here. So let's look at Romans 9 through 11 in an outline form. Uh, I'm combining certain kind of tools of the trade and biblical studies and then also patristics. Uh, you'll, you'll see some com combination here. Uh, I, I said, I think this is a chiasm. A chiasm is where the first point matches the last point, second point matches the second to last point, and so on until you get to the center. The center is the main point, and it kind of uh, holds everything together. Sometimes there's a turning, um, uh, not, not, of, not, of, not that the topics change, but that the responses maybe in the second half of the chiasm answer the first half of the chiasm or develop the first half of the chiasm. And so uh, it, it's just important to observe here, Paul is on a mission. Paul is speaking as a missionary here. And he wants, he starts off in chapter nine, verses one through six, he wants more Jews to know Jesus. And then at the end, he says, Paul's more motivated to share Jesus with both Gentiles and Jews. And there's a reciprocal way that that's beneficial because God desires to show mercy to all. That's what he's doing. So whatever we think is in between there, <laughs> I mean, we know this much, like at the beginning and at the end, Paul is speaking as a missionary. <clears throat> Here is what happens in the middle. B, Israel is not ethnic or genetic. And the example Paul uses is God pruned it, pruned down the family, uh, the biological line. C, God hardened the hearts of his Pharaoh and his Israelites. <clears throat> D, God's word did not fail. Uh, and he talks about Israel's remnant. E, the center, Christ is the telos or the climax of the covenant, the goal of the covenant. D prime, God's word did not fail with regards to the Gentiles, which complements Israel's remnant. In C prime, God hardened the hearts of Israelites in some way. B prime, Israel is not ethnic or genetic. Notice what he's doing there. God is grafting in Gentiles and, and then Jews also to the, the trunk of Abraham and Sarah. And then mission, A prime. So let's look at that section. Uh, here, here are those two passages. I'm telling the truth in Christ, right? I mean, I, I'm going to read this just so we, we understand the, the emotion the flavor, the purpose that Paul writes with. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I, I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, there's a lot there. And by the way, the term the flesh there, I think is doing double duty. I think it, it, it is speaking of biological lineage, but also circumcision. Notice all of the things that he describes about the, the community of Israel. Circumcision is not there explicitly, but I think it's implicit in the term the flesh, because what is cut away in circumcision? Well, the flesh. Anyway, uh, and at the, in, in chapter 11, on the other side, he says this, but I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up 
i.e. verbally silenced, like in Romans 3.20, God has verbally silenced all in disobedience so that he might show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Wow. I mean, doxology is there. So that, that is Paul's heart. He is a missionary. He wants, okay, first Jews to know Jesus. Yes. He wants Gentiles to know Jesus because it helps Jews to be motivated to know Jesus. Okay. So why does he say this? Well, his supporting points, first supporting point is that Israel, the term, is not ethnic or genetic. So what does he mean? Well, one example he cites is, Jacob have I loved, Esau I hated. Well, see, right there. I, I mean, both are sons of Isaac. If bi biology is all that mattered, then wh why isn't it uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau too? Uh, so that is, th <laughs> that, that could have maybe been one way to go. But um, this quote comes from Malachi 1, and it's a, it, it seems to be a demonstration of God's arbitrary will to choose who belongs to him or not. Or is it something else? So Esau and God in Genesis 32 and 33, it's pretty clear. Esau has a relationship with God. Like when Jacob went away for I don't know how many years and then came back, 40 years, and then came back. <clears throat> Esau had learned about God from Isaac and Rebekah, his mom and his dad and mom. And so at the when he receives Jacob back, Esau's generosity, his eagerness to reconcile with his brother, they are on full display. And Jacob even says, seeing the, your face, the face of Esau is like seeing the face of God. So compare these two scriptures, Genesis 32, 30 and 33, 10. That is no coincidence right there. God's blessing of fertility and prosperity also fell on Esau and his family. So Esau gets a genealogy in Genesis 36. So what does that phrase mean? It means God narrowed the covenant people according to Jacob's faith. And, uh, and yes, there was a narrowing of the covenant. And we talked about that last week but it was for the sake of others, including Esau, right? So Esau could have a relationship with God, could even be blessed by God. Uh, and so the covenant is for Esau. And ultimately, Jesus died also for Esau, right? So the covenant is in inclusive of, or it, it is for Esau, even though the, descent, the, the lineage of the covenant uh, Show, God chose Jacob rather than Esau. And so this is not reflecting God's emotions towards Jacob and Esau. I mean, there's a whole debate about how, what emotions does God have? I won't get into that. But <clears throat> in any case, this is unique and not generalizable. It's not as if we can say something like, you know, <laughs> uh, Mako God loved, but you know, other people, uh, who knows? But the you see what I mean? It is not generalizable like that. <clears throat> so here's examples that I, I, I think Paul might have considered talking about, but for the sake of time, time and space, just didn't. Uh, here are all the people dis descent, not descended for Abraham and Sarah who joined Israel. She was daughter. She was a Canaanite woman, married Judah. Tamar, Canaanite woman, married Judah's son. The mixed multitude from Egypt became part of Israel during Exodus, was probably circumcised. Caleb, one of the two lieutenants of Moses, the son of Jephunneh, he was a Canaanite. He was ethnically Kenizzite. Rahab and her household in Joshua 6. She, be she became part of Israel, part of the tribe of Judah, ancestor of David, ancestor of Jesus. The Gibeonites in Joshua 9 through 11, Canaanite tribe. Ruth, a Moabitess, and Bathsheba the Hittite became a grandmother of uh, Jesus, became a wife of King David. So, I mean, clearly there are people who are, are kind of convert in to become part of Israel. 
There are warnings against marrying outsiders, like in Nehemiah 13, but that's an interfaith issue, not an interethnic issue. So that's important to watch out for. Okay, and, and there are believers who remained outside the Jewish covenant, like Melchizedek, Abimelech, Esau, Balaam, Naaman the Syrian, Ninevites, and Nebuchadnezzar, just to name a few that we know of. They believe in God, at least on some level, or they're responding to what they know of God or what they were presented with, and they're portrayed favorably, and so, okay. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt that Joseph knew, there's another one. So, but they don't, they don't seem to all join the Jewish covenant. They don't marry in, and so on and so forth. So belief in God and participation in the Sinai covenant were not absolutely synonymous. If you want more explanation of that in the Jewish covenant in general, see this paper, Why Choose a Chosen People? It's on my website. And in light of Jesus, the question is, what and who is Israel? What are they? Um, I would say they're a microcosm, right? They're an example of a multi-ethnic faith because what is Jesus? He's the multi-ethnic person, the faithful one. And the church is the kind of a full, or as, at least supposed to be a full picture of both Jew and Gentile, a multi-ethnic faith community now configured around Jesus. All right, so, so then one thing that Paul does is he talks about the hardening of hearts because he's he's showing how uh, God moved through history and what he did in order to bring people to new points of uh, connection and community. And so what he does is he talks about first the hardening of hearts. Now with Pharaoh, how many of you have ever seen, uh, well, uh, Hold this in your mind because I want to ask, I want to come back to it later. But the entirety of the, the 10 plagues on Egypt taught as one literary unit. You should because it's really compelling. And so here's, here's um, research drawn by Nahum Sarna, Umberto Casuto, and others. 10 plagues, um, you could see here working from left to right, there's the Exodus text, there's the type of plague it is. Uh, is there a warning given? Okay, so when the first one is blood, the, the Nile turns to blood, yes, there's a warning. Frogs coming out of the Nile River, yes, there's a warning. Lice, no, no warning. So there's a yes, yes, none that gets repeated. Yes, yes, none, yes, yes, none, and then a yes. The, what is the time of that warning? It's in the morning for the first one. None, none, um, or, or at least none specified, right? For the fourth plague and the seventh plague in the morning. Interesting, right? There's an instruction formula. Uh, Moses and Aaron are, God tells them, station yourself in the first one. The second one, go to Pharaoh. And the third one, no particular instruction. That gets repeated. Who speaks? Aaron, Aaron, God, God, Moses, 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 God. Uh, not a pattern, but it, it shows who, who God involves. And then who hardens Pharaoh's heart? Pharaoh, 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 God, Pharaoh, God, God, God. Here's why this is important when we look at how Paul is using uh, this passage or quoting from this passage in Romans 9. I mean, who, who first hardened Pharaoh's heart? Pharaoh. So, but if Paul says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, how are we supposed to understand that? Because the text of Exodus gives, at the very least, gives 10 possible places to choose from. Why would Paul choose from 6, 8, 9, and 10? Isn't that proof text? Is, oh, is he just like very selective there? How, you know, right? Because I argued before that every time scripture quotes from an earlier scripture, it's more like a hyperlink, right? It's you click on it, you go there, you look at the whole context. What's the whole context here? It, sh it sure starts to seem fishy. Like, well, wh why would Paul quote, how come he just doesn't say Pharaoh hardened his own heart? <laughs> okay, 
So what's the significance of the Exodus narrative? It's likely a critique of the Egyptian pantheon of gods, right? Like the different uh, heads that are on the Egyptian gods and goddesses that seems somehow connected to the plagues and the type of plagues they are. Also, God relaxed boundaries established in creation. So God said, you know, let there be a separation between water and water and then water and land. And here, as Israel fights, I mean, as Egypt and as Pharaoh fights God, creation unravels. So that's a lesson. It is an uncreation. It's also clearly one story that's woven tightly together using literary patterns. So the number 10 is associated with a foundation on which more is built on, or on which more can be built. How do, why do I say that? It, because in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, the creation hymn, God says, let there be or let us bless 10 times. There are 10 utterances of God. There are 10 people in the, in, in the genealogy, or there's 10 listed, there's 10 names listed. Uh, yeah, I could answer more questions about that later. I, I don't think those are simply sequential. I think those are so highly selective, um, just like Matthew, Chronicles, Luke, you know, like all those books, they, they write selective genealogies. Genesis 5 is a selective genealogy as well. 10 generations, 10 generations listed between Shem and Abraham in Genesis 11, 10 genealogies comprising Genesis 2 through 50. Wow. So, okay, Genesis is this, creation him as an introduction, then 10 genealogies, and then you get the birth of Israel out of Egypt. Then you, 10 plagues on Egypt in Exodus 7 through 12, 10 commandments for Israel in Exodus 19, and then Matthew knows about this and says, let me rearrange 10 healings that Jesus did by his word and compress them into two chapters. So 10 healings in Matthew 8 and 9. Why? because Jesus is God, his word is powerful, right? He's delivering people out of death, disease, the demons. He's a, Matthew's a Jewish theologian. Of course, he would use that structure. So again, was Paul pulling one part of this out of context? <laughs> uh, let's look further. Here's evidence that Pharaoh was first to harden his heart. First, God predicts it. In Exodus 3, I know that the kingdom of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I will do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it will sh it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty handed. Uh, so, so right away, that's kind of helpful because like, why does God use 10? Um, why does, it, you know, it, one of the, there, there seem to be two, at least one reason is the people of the Egyptians have to be so motivated to let Israel go that they'll, they'll send them with stuff, right? <laughs> like the, they, they plunder the Egyptians in that sense. Uh, so on a narrative level, that, that seems to be one reason why uh, God uses 10. And God says he, he will further harden Pharaoh's heart to make 10 numerical signs in order to accomplish this pattern. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Okay, so he says that. So both are happening, but how? Okay, here are the 10 times. So first plague, it is spoken of in the passive voice and it's ascribed to Pharaoh. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, uh, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. So hardened heart mean, means hardened ears. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. And so it's ascribed to Pharaoh. Passive voice again, second miracle. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord said. Then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern, even for this. Third uh, third plague, active voice. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Ah, okay, so that, 
that makes it pretty clear. I mean, in, in case you wanted to argue in the, that the passive voice indicates somehow that God was hardening Pharaoh's heart, no, uh, it's just a, another way, a complementary way of saying Pharaoh did not listen. That was the action. Uh, and then the fourth plague, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them. Uh, and then switches to the active voice, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and he did not let the people go, which connects the fourth occasion to the previous ones. Okay, so Pharaoh not listening is Pharaoh hardening his own heart. And then in plagues five through seven, the passive voice, active voice, passive voice. Um, but in, in plague six, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart which I've colored there in green. That is different. Uh, in in uh, the seventh one, he sinned again and hardened his heart. He and his servants. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Okay, so that's pretty clear. It's, it's Pharaoh. <clears throat> uh, actually, why did I say passive voice? That should be active voice. Um, plagues eight, nine, and 10. Active voice. God hardens Pharaoh's heart in each of those. Okay. Now, what is this? This it, what is hardness of heart? Well, there are literary roots. Uh, it comes from this idea that we're made out of the earth or the clay or the dust of the ground from Genesis two through seven, because uh, this this is a pottery image uh, formed yatsar, as in in Genesis two seven that God formed man of dust from the ground can be applied to humans and God making both physical things and also plans. So, you know, I can form a pot and I can form a plan. Both words, you can use the word yatsa, formed. Uh, a human potter, and then there, here's some references. The overwhelming number is, uh, you know, to, to physical things. <clears throat> And Jeremiah makes this explicit when he says, uh, he uses the potter and clay image, which Paul also uses. He doesn't, he doesn't say it's coming from Jeremiah. It's, like he, it's likely he's thinking about it, but uh, uh, more, more so as a motif rather than as a direct quotation. And so the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. And then I went down there, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. And he, Jeremiah uses this to say, this is what the exile is going to be for Israel. Like, Israel is clay, and they kind of spun out of control, so they're misshapen. So God is going to use the exile like a second go round on the potter's wheel. He's going to refashion Israel. So that's what's happening. That's the potter clay image. And um, there's a lot of other ways that other folks use this in scripture. Uh, Moses uses this phrase when he connects it to human being and human becoming. Uh, he says, if there's a poor man with you, one of your brothers in any of your towns in your land, which the Lord God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need and whatever he lacks. And so the, the idea here is God desires softness of heart. We have a choice in the matter. Oh my, I think there's a funeral procession going by my street. Here is how the early church understood the, this phrase. Here's Irenaeus of Leon, second century. If then thou art God's workmanship, await the, the hand of thy maker, which creates everything in due time, in due time as far as thou art concerned, whose creation is being carried out. Offer to him thy heart in a soft and tractable state, and preserve the form in which the creator has fashioned thee, having moisture in thyself, lest by becoming hardened, thou lose the impressions of his fingers. But by preserving the framework, thou shalt ascend to that which is perfect, that is God or godliness, 
for the moist clay which is in thee is, is hidden there by the workmanship of God. That's the heart. His hand fashioned thy substance. He will cover thee over within and without with pure gold and silver and will adorn thee to such a degree that even the king himself shall have pleasure in thy beauty. But if thou being obstinately hardened dost reject the operation of his skill and show thyself ungrateful towards him because thou were created a mere man by becoming thus ungrateful to God, thou hast at once lost both his workmanship and life. For creation is an attribute of the goodness of God or a result of the goodness of God. But to be created is that of human nature, or in other words, to finish becoming human, right? Human being, human becoming. Uh, if then thou shalt de deliver up to him what is thine, that is faith towards him and subjection, thou shalt receive his handiwork and shall be a perfect work of God. So we're in process. That's what Irenaeus is saying. Fascinating. Uh, Origen says this, but to establish the point more clearly, it will not be superfluous to employ another illustration as if, for example, one were to say that it's the sun which hardens and liquefies, although liquefying and hardening are things of an opposite nature. Now, it is not incorrect to say that the sun, by one and the same power of its heat, melts wax, but dries up and hardens mud. Not that the power operates one way on mud and in another way upon wax, but that the qualities of mud and wax are different. Although according to nature, they're one thing, both being from the earth. Notice what he's doing there. He's saying, he, he's talking about people. You could be soft-hearted or hard-hearted. You're the same nature. In this way, then, one and the same working upon the part of God, which was administered by Moses in signs and wonders, made manifest the hardness of Pharaoh, which he had conceived in the intensity of his wickedness, but exhibited the obedience of those other Egyptians who were intermingled with the Israelites and who are recorded to have quitted Egypt. I love that phrase. <laughs> they quitted Egypt at the same time with the Hebrews. I've had it with this guy, this Pharaoh. I'm leaving, right? But it, essentially what God did revealed something that was already there. Okay, and here's Maximus the confessor in the sixth century uh, or sixth to seventh. God is the son of justice as, it, as it's written, who shines rays of goodness on simply everyone, not just like those he really like or not the elect or something like that, everyone. The soul develops according to its free will into either wax because of its love for God or into mud because of its love for matter. Thus, just as by nature the mud is dried out by the sun, the wax and the wax is automatically softened. So also every soul which loves matter, I would say loves matter first and the world ha and has fixed its mind far from God is hardened as mud according to its free will and by itself advances to its perdition, as did Pharaoh. However, every soul which loves God is softened as wax, and receiving div divine impressions and characters, characters, right? Remember, we talked about Israel is the scribe of the heart. Characters, it becomes the dwelling place of God in the spirit. Okay. So in Exodus 7 through 11, and in Romans 9 through 11, God either knew a few cases, like plagues 6, 8, 9, and 10, when his word would push Pharaoh into resistance. So if you take a sequential view of the, the plagues and Pharaoh hardens his heart early on, God, I mean, maybe he could have let go before, but, the, but, but somehow God hardened his, his heart in the 6, 8, 9, and 10 plagues. Or God either knew Pharaoh's disposition anyway, right? And so, so there, there is, a, I wonder whether it's something like this. Did God send Pharaoh a vision of Israel flourishing in the garden land? I mean, that could, that could very well be. And, and later in 1 Samuel, uh, you probably know the story when, when uh, King Saul is on the throne and David has been anointed to become the next king, uh, King Saul becomes paranoid and kind of goes crazy. He has a total mental breakdown. 
and it it says something like God sent a uh, a weird spirit. It's a difficult verse to translate, but a spirit that somehow uh, has an evil effect on Saul. Uh, well, how? Maybe God sent King Saul a vision of David on the throne. Is that by itself evil? No, but something about how Saul or Pharaoh, what they've done to themselves, that, um, you know, it just it just pushes them over the edge. I, I mean, something similar might be, I, to, to, just to cite something in modern politics, if you were to sit down with Donald Trump and say, the election was not stolen, I mean, what's he gonna do? It's gonna just throw him into a rage. Doesn't mean it's false, but it, it's just when you convince, when someone convinces themselves of a certain outcome or course of action, or a belief that is false or against God, that, well, it's the truth itself becomes something that is hardening to them. So uh, that's a, that, that is a sequential option. Or Philo, Irenaeus, Origen, and Maxima seem to view hardening as simultaneous. Simultaneous, due to both Pharaoh and God. They, they all deny that there is such a thing as divine determinism, right? So they're, they're taking care to explain from, from traditions of Jewish and early Christian belief that human free will is always operating. Pharaoh had a choice, but you, you become something, either mud or wax, and you're either hardened or softened to God's word and God's purposes. So let's take a, a moment here. What do you think this phrase means? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Is that, do you think that's sequential or simultaneous? Yeah, I just, the only thought is not really, this helped me, at, at least for me, like, because I had, I struggled with the more deterministic kind of view of the human heart. And I yeah. felt like, when I read Psalm one, it kind of like opened up my personal view where it, it says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step of the wicked, stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. And my, that kind of opened up my world because like, oh yeah, the, the hardening of a heart is this process. We begin walking, then we stand and then we become calcified and sit in it. And that for me has been like very helpful as I understand the human heart and then get out of some circles I was in the kind of the circles I'm in now, it's more of like a, just a more robust view of the human heart and how it operates. So that's, that's been helpful for me. But um, to me, it, I don't really have like, it's never, I, it makes more sense that it's more, uh, what's the language you used? Si simultaneous in the sense of it's both human and God. Um, sure. But yeah, it's not really a distinct answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Carter. I feel like this goes really well uh, with what we talked about, <clears throat> I guess, a couple weeks ago and talking about like heaping burning coals on their head and the sense of purification. And if this is how God interacts with us, um, it's still, uh, it, it, it follows that same sort of analogy that you were talking about, a sense of like, uh, I was going somewhere better with this and, and it all kind of fell apart in my brain. But that same idea of like things that are good don't feel good to us when we're not in that alignment in the same sort of way. And the hardening of his heart is because God could show him good things, but they wouldn't be good to him in the same way because of his, the way he's allowed himself to be shaped and formed. Exactly. That, no, you, thank you, Paul. You said it well. And the, the Roman 12 example of heaping burning coals, like leave room for the wrath of God, love them, love your enemy. And by so doing, you'll heap burning coals on their head. <laughs> like, huh, interesting. So, <clears throat> yes. All right. So I'm going to press on here. Um, so uh, needless to say, every Christian theologian and commentator prior to Augustine strongly believed in human free will. 
uh, Catholics, in fact, take Augustine as still affirming human free will. Now, how they do that is interesting, but it, you, I gave you a sense for that in the paper that is kind of my ongoing project. I collect quotations, ample quotations, so that no one would, would accuse me or others you know, of um, quoting people out of context in this, in this document, Human Free Will in the Early Church Fathers. <clears throat> I think that's the title. But anyway, the so I had you look at some of those and you could see like Augustine was the first to say, well, maybe not. <laughs> and so at in his later years. Uh, okay, I, I just have a few more notes here about hardness of heart, how it's used. Um, and I think Carter, you had mentioned, yeah, there are, you know, for example, some who would say whenever this phrase comes up, it reflects human beings for all time in every place, as opposed to the particular state in which these particular people got to, right? That, so, so notice how you could read this. After looking around at them, the Pharisees with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now, when, so when Mark says that, is his understanding like, is everyone, suffering from hardness of heart in this particular way? Well, no, because some respond to Jesus with softness of heart. So no, it doesn't apply to everyone, but these particular people, yeah, they've gotten to that point. Um, and this is a, 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 a kind of phrase in Mark that, that we should pay attention to in Mark 6. The disciples reach this limit uh, because Jesus, because following Jesus seems to, or encountering Jesus, everyone en encounters this limit at some point. The disciples got to the boat, the wind stopped, they were astonished, they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. By that point, um, I don't think we're meant to read that as, okay, like back in Mark 1 and 2, their heart were, the hearts were hardened, because otherwise they wouldn't follow Jesus. But something stops them there. And then um, Jesus does describe <clears throat> that uh, Israel having hardness of heart when God gives them commandment uh, related to marriage and divorce because of your hardness of heart. He wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, it was not so, in Mark 10. Uh, and then hearts are corrupted, but more corruptible. Okay, so there's this downward slide that we certainly can get into. Jesus said, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. From, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so <clears throat> all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. You mean, are we, are we ever as defiled as we could be? Probably not. <laughs> but are, as, are, are we as clean as we should be? Probably not. The, uh, certainly not. So in any case, there's this corrupted and further corruptible. That's the heart. And what did I say here? And where does that come from? It comes from the Pentateuch, right? The, the uh, what is the human heart here? And uh, there are two places that are really important to watch. Genesis 1 through 11 and Deuteronomy 30 to 34. They sit on the beginning and end points of a massive chiasm that runs through the entire Pentateuch. And you could see the similarity here. In, in part A, God's spirit hovers as God creates heaven and earth. God places humanity in a garden land, but they leave an exile and with a, corrupt, a corruption and corruptibility in human hearts. And then you have the origin of all nations. And then at the end, God must circumcise human hearts after Israel's exile to bring folks back into the garden. And then heaven and earth witness the destiny of Israel and the nations. God's spirit hovers, notice the same term, over Israel as they enter the garden land. This is another creation, right? God's spirit leading Israel to become another Adam and Eve. At this point, maybe version 4.0, as far as the Pentateuch is concerned. 
Okay, but the heart, that's the concern. <laughs> and uh, in case you're wondering exactly what I mean, okay, in Genesis 3, she saw, took, ate, and he ate, then the eyes of both of them were opened, right? So you, you are what you eat. You want to take in the desire to define good and evil on into yourself, and they did, uh, which is a prerogative of God. They want to be little gods. I want to, I want to believe that there's an absolute good and evil, and I want to be the one to define it. <laughs> That's just crazy. So, and then <clears throat> Cain goes further. Now you are cursed from the ground, right? Adam and Eve were not cursed from the ground. Uh, they didn't have an easy time, but <clears throat> Cain took it a step further. And so that's an example. By the time of Noah, and, and by the way, that's the first genealogy. The second genealogy is the genealogy of Adam. And then the Lord, which finishes this way, the Lord saw that the intent of the heart, uh, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then there's the genealogy of Noah the the other new the first new creation that was part of the old creation uh still the summary is the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth even in like noah's family <clears throat> so the finale is the lord your god will have to circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants so that you can love god with all your heart okay so there it is that's where these passages are situated on uh, the first and last, in the first and last sections of the Pentateuch. Very important. Um, Jeremiah also says the human heart is corrupted and further corruptible, right? When he says circumcise your heart, uh, everyone else is uncircumcised, so are you. And then your heart has this, the script of sin in it in Jeremiah 17, uh, the heart is desperately sick. Uh, and then I'm gonna rewrite the script in Jeremiah 31. Romans, similar thing. Uh, circumcision is that which is of the heart. It's the faithfulness of Christ Jesus that changes human nature in him. Uh, and he killed the thing that was killing us. That's why our old self is crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with. So we participate in his death and resurrection because Jesus, in the likeness of our sinful flesh, condemns sin in the flesh, never sinning, uh, and purifying our human nature in himself. All right. So back to Romans. Who is hardened? Only Pharaoh and some Jews. That was kind of a lengthy uh, treatment of this. <clears throat> Who hardens? Well, actually, so hardness of heart can refer to the general condition of corruption from the fall and the effect of further personal choices. God only hardened hearts on two occasions, Pharaoh and this incident that Paul is referring to. Um, the first exodus is that Israel, God leads Israel out of Pharaoh's rule and into the garden land. Uh, there's, there's also Sihon of Og, I, I guess, is also kind of in, included in that. Uh, God did harden his heart. So I'm including that. The second exodus is Jesus's. Uh, Jesus said he had an exodon to go through in Luke 9, 31. He calls his death and resurrection an exodus. Why? Because he's, he's coming out of the, the domain, the rule of a fallen human nature or Satan's domain and into a fixed and fulfilled human nature, a corrected and cli you know, climaxed human nature. <clears throat> uh, and that's his exodus. So what Paul is doing is he is saying there's a symmetry here. Notice uh, Pharaoh is a Gentile ruler and, and there's a court. And then also the Jews that Paul seems to be referring to are the Jewish rulers of Jesus's generation. And the hardness of heart comes about when God's love for others is pushed too far. Pharaoh feared the loss of Jewish slaves. Jewish rulers feared the loss of their temple power. Uh, and the inclusion of the Gentiles. So who hardens this? Human beings. And it's reinforced. Yes, it's reinforced by God, at least in some sense. Uh, I, I tend to think, by the way, that it's sequential. 
but I, I can really appreciate the simultaneous view. Uh, but it, it, it is not apart from human choice. God, Paul believed that the hardening of Israel was partial, and I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. Uh, it might mean perhaps it's not as intense as with Pharaoh. It might mean perhaps it's not as widespread, right? It's for leaders only. And I tend to think it's centered around Jesus's death, partial and not total, because he kept reaching out to folks in the Jewish community. So whatever he means by this, he doesn't see it as operating um, in a way that discourages him. If he was discouraged, if he thought it was total and that it was eternal, then he would give up and he would go to the Gentiles. <clears throat> so the duration is momentary, the consequences are historical, and the purpose is to show more mercy. We should never ever say God hardened a person's heart outside of these two occasions. I would encourage us to reserve the use of that phrase. Uh, for these, these occasions. Once God achieves his historical purpose in Exodus, uh, whether Israel's or Jesus's, does the hardening continue? Scripture is silent, but probably not. Uh, recall Paul's love and hope for both Jew and Gentile, right? So why is he still hoping? Well, because God wants to save everybody. <clears throat> and he's Paul is referring to the Exodus narrative with literary integrity. God is loving and missional. It is striking. I, I forget it. I think it's Maximus the Confessor. No, it's Origen or Maximus that says, yeah, I mean, even some Egyptians left Egypt. <laughs> they, they quit Egypt. Uh, they're like, I'm done with Pharaoh. He's just crazy. <clears throat> uh, th there are undertones of that that I think Paul is capitalizing on. Everyone knew that story. So uh, Paul is capitalizing on it. God is missional. And Paul was aware of the interplay of Pharaoh's hardening of his own heart and God's hardening of his heart to achieve a historical purpose. Um, okay, so if you, in summary, as far as the church and the church interpreting this are concerned, uh, all early Christians, save the later Augustine, believed in human free will um, because they were strong Trinitarians. Wh why did we have free will? Because God loves us. <clears throat> that, that's just definitional about love. Um, here's some resources. The Eastern Orthodox, 100% of them believe this. Roman Catholics, well, on paper, 100% of them believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the Benyazians, which we'll get to later, but there is, they're kind of a rogue Catholic group. Uh, and then there's Protestants who are systematic Trinitarian theologians. As an example, Donald Blesch, who uh, kind of follows Karl Barth. N.T. Wright also uh, talks about this. So that is the hardening of hearts. <clears throat> D and D prime. God's word did not fail. Why is this important? Right, this, this is something Paul brings up as part of his argument. Why is it important for him to say this? Because there's the pattern. If you're Jewish, you know, God says what he does and does what he says, right? And that's the way to tell how, what God is doing as opposed to what everyone else is doing, right? God is not causing the craziness. God is not the author of evil. God only does what he said he would do. So the pattern, let there be light, and then there is. I will redeem your descendants from bondage, and then he does. Abraham and Sarah, you will have a son, and then they do. David, you're going to be the king, and then it happens. This pattern of promise and fulfillment means uh, that it, 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 there is an ironclad, unbroken pattern that God uh, identifies himself and then explains why he's trustworthy. It's so unbroken that Amos 3 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, underscore nothing, nothing except that which he reveals to his servants, the prophets. In other words, prophets are those to whom God speaks first, and 
God doesn't do anything except speaking about it first and, and saying, this is what you can watch me do. Uh, so I, I'm really, into, I, I've asked people who come from other traditions in, Christian, in the Christian world that say God does everything. Like, how is that possible? Tell me what Amos 3, 7 says. God does nothing except what he said he would do. Um, that's the response that I get. So notice that a doctrine of God's omnicausality would contradict Amos 3, 7 and the biblical pattern to which Amos was referring. So this, the significance uh, of the Jewish community is that the Jews contributed the world's first linear sense of history and the happy ending story. If you want to uh, want, want really good illustrations of that, read Thomas Cahill's book, The Gifts of the Jews. Uh, if you like Disney movies with the happy ending, if you, have, if you like any movies like and stories, books, songs with a happy ending, thank you to Israel. Because they, this is what they could understand, right? Like God is not evil. He is only good. How do we know? Because he says he, he's not doing all this other stuff that we see other people do. So God's speech acts leave room for genuine human free will and real interaction be, between God and us. They are events in our time and history, very significant epistemologically, because that's how we know what God is doing as opposed to what everyone else is doing. They allow God to be 100% good, not partly evil, and this gives rise to the happy ending. Paul has to explain why not all Jews have come to Jesus. Is this a failure of God's word? That's the concern here. So Augustine's monergism, which means one will, mon, mono meaning one, ergo meaning will in Latin, uh, or Greek, sorry, God is omnicausal, is problematic and incorrect. If you believe in monergism, then you must attribute all human sinfulness back to God, including the fall, subsequent sins, unbelief, evil, injustice, and perdition. All, but that isn't what anyone else said, right? All earlier theologians believed in human free will as the only way God could be 100% good. We looked at that especially when we looked at Athanasius, the goodness of God and the healing of creation. How did Athanasius develop his argument? He explains first that God is good. And Augustine himself in his early years believed in free will. Uh, <laughs> I won't speculate as to why he changed. John Cassian, another leading theologian, during the time of Augustine and Pelagius, right? Like as Protestants, we've probably heard about this debate, Augustine versus Pelagius. And oh, Augustine's on the right side and Pelagius is on the wrong side. Well, actually it wasn't just two way, it was three way. John Cassian was involved and he wrote a sensitive critical response to Augustine. So you should read him. Uh, and that's who the Eastern Orthodox stand behind. So it is not a two-way debate, it's three-way. So this is what, how Paul understands God's word in relation to Israel and the nations. Uh, forgive me, I'm gonna read this, but notice I've highlighted the, the places in Hosea and Isaiah and the Psalms that he's quoting from. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, Unless the Lord of Sabaoth, I think armies, left us left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained it, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. 
but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as, as it's written in Isaiah 8 and Psalm 8, 118. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disturbed. This, Paul says, is true of the generation of Jews at the time of Jesus. Okay, that, that's what he's saying. <clears throat> uh, and he's saying God foresaw it and acted in that way. Now, in, then in Romans 10, he says, well, that's not all. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good tidings. However, they did not all heed the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? He's, he, he is taking on a second voice. Uh, first, Moses says, I will make you jealous. This is Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. Uh, by a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me, at least at first. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Okay, so one, why do I do this? Uh, th this is how Paul quotes Isaiah in Romans 9 through 11. Um, Isaiah is really important to Paul's argument, as you've been hearing, the, you know, these samples, because Isaiah himself says, you know, when, when God, God comes as Messiah, uh, when that happens, Israel itself will be divided. So, so this is Paul's way of saying, this was not a failure of God's word. This is actually what God... Uh, uh, expected would happen or knew what happened um, based on how nationalistic Israel was becoming. That, that is the theme of Isaiah. Um, and Paul's quotation of Moses comes from here. Remember, Deuteronomy 32, verse 21 is part of that last section of the Pentateuch, which I was showing you. The, it's there. <clears throat> and um, and so Paul is following Moses and Isaiah in diagnosing the human heart and human choices, in expecting that human hearts, that Israel's hearts will be hardened when the Messiah comes, and in saying God will speak truth to Israel through Gentiles, like this is also part of, here are some really important uh, pieces of that, that poem in Deuteronomy 32. But Jeshurun, or Israel, grew fat and kicked, you are grown fat, thick, and sleek, then he forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. Kind of like a, you know, like a, a cattle, cattle or livestock, I, I, I guess, who, who does not believe they need to um, be fed anymore um, or, or to, by the master. And they have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Interesting. So, again, like last week, uh, it this is this does seem to comport with the sense that the tabernacle was God's plan B next to meeting God face to face on Mount Sinai, especially because the temple and Jerusalem had become kind of a lightning rod, almost like I, I will die for the flag type of symbol of like there's no way I'm just letting the Romans have this. And uh, that, that's what it came to mean for the Jews of Jesus's generation. <clears throat> um, Moses saw Israel fail. <laughs> Moses saw Israel fail repeatedly, became the mediator, but failed himself. 
The Sinai laws, Sinai laws were intended to be temporary. Uh, they were a diminished version of the creation order, related to it, but diminished. And that the chosen people um, category is a clinic. It's vital for self-diagnosis, but relativized. They were expected to partially resist God. So that is Paul's point there in D and D prime. And then we get to the center of the, the chiasm. Christ is the telos of the covenant. The whole point of the covenant was Jesus coming. So I'm going to skip that over that. Uh, I reviewed some of this before. Um, there are dynamics of narrowing and widening that, that Paul is working with, that he's summarizing from uh, the story of Israel, that there's Abraham and Sarah uh, to begin with, that there's Isaac, but not Ishmael, Jacob, but not Esau, Judah, even, but not the other 11 brothers, although they're still included in there, David as the king, and then Solomon as the royal line, right? So uh, once the kingship arises, um, Israel, in order to be part of the Davidic covenant, they have to follow the Davidic line. And then you have, <clears throat> so you have this dynamic of the chosen people get narrowed and then widened, and that dynamic happens consistently until you get down to the chosen one. And Jesus in Matthew 20, in Matthew 12 and Luke 9 is called the chosen one. Jesus is the embodiment and fulfillment of Israel. Jesus alone did what Israel could not do, which is defeat the flesh, change the heart, and restore human nature back to God. This is what the human vocation was. Israel just had a had that be explicit. And then it widens, right? The, the covenant opens up again. The, the whole world is invited, Jew and Gentile. So, so the question of if Jesus was the climax of the covenant, then why, do, why should we have a chosen people at all? Um, I know I hit some of these last week. Well, basically it's to be a clinic to voluntarily be God's covenant human partner because the rest of humanity, they were, you know, the, it's a patient population that's uncooperative with the doctor. Israel was cooperative to be a microcosm of humanity to live by God's word and hope for a happy ending. Like they really are contributing something to our understanding of God, to diagnose the corruption of human nature, to document the diagnosis, to anticipate God's cure and his dwelling within people and to oppose pagan systems and glimpse the Trinity. Glimpse it because when, when God's Shekinah glory comes to live in the temple, and Solomon says, you're here, and yet you're more than just here. That is Trinitarian in the sense of uh, God lives in his temple, but that is a manifestation to us of imminence, God's imminence. God is imminent, he is transcendent, and there is a link between them. In a sense, that is God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Son is the temple always their true temple to which these things were pointing. The son is the imminence of God. The father is the transcendence of God. The spirit is the link between them, the love between them. So yeah, uh, Israel glimpsed the Trinity in that sense. And so the chosen one is the cure. He perfects the vocation of Israel. And this is also what it means when, when Paul says, Christ is the telos of the covenant. He was truly partnered with God, like 100%, no holds, no holds barred, no holding back, to be, to be God's covenant human partner, partner. No one else had done that. That means he is God's new humanity. He, to, to be and, you know, like lived by God's word. I mean, he is both and it, he both lived by and is God's word. And, and so he embodied a happy ending, and he, but he hoped for a happy ending, which is interesting, right? Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, right? Like he hoped for a happy ending, um, even though he brought about in himself, because he reversed the corruption of human nature in his own body. <clears throat> Hebrews 5, uh, he became perfect, 
he became perfect? Meaning he, he wasn't like born perfect? Yeah, he became perfect after he learned obedience as a son and went through death and resurrection. That was perfection is resurrection. And so to validate the diagnosis of like, yeah, everything Israel said about this problem is true. He is God's cure and he, he is the dwelling of God in human personhood. And he explained the Trinity and <laughs> shared the spirit. So all the things Jesus did was, was rooted in a preliminary sense in what Israel did. <clears throat> and, and so it's a lot like uh, how Frodo retold <laughs> Gollum story or Smeagol story, right? Like Smeagol was the tragic hero in Lord of the Rings. I don't know if y'all are Lord of the Rings fan. I totally am. Watch it every year. But the, <clears throat> uh, the sense of when Frodo puts on the ring, it's like Jesus put, coming into human nature, like at Christmas. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh of Israel, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And, and then he started fighting with it, right? Struggling against it. And it struggled back. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So he succeeded in going to Mount Doom. And unlike Frodo, he was not, see, Frodo gave in. Jesus threw the ring into the fire, in a sense. He pushed it all the way to, into death and then resurrection, so that we might participate in that victory, so that the requirement of the law, or the Torah, might be fulfilled in us. What is that? Circumcision of the heart, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, that we might be, that we might walk in that fulfillment, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Fair enough. Irenaeus, you know, put it this way. Therefore, and he compares Israel and Jesus. Therefore, as I've already said, he caused man or human nature to cleave to and become one with God. But the law coming, which was given by Moses, laid, however, a weighty burden upon man who had sin in himself, showing that he was liable to death. For if the law was spiritual, it merely made sin to stand out in relief, but it did not destroy it, but did not destroy it. For sin had no dominion over the spirit, but over man, for it behooved him who was to destroy sin and redeem man under the power of death, that he should himself be made that very same thing which he was, that is, man, who had been drawn by sin into bondage, but was held by death, so that sin should be destroyed by man, and man should go forth from death. For as by the disobedience of the one man who was originally molded from virgin soil, the many were made sinners and forfeited life, that is the tree of life, so was it necessary that by the obedience of one man who was originally born from a virgin, many should be justified and receive salvation. Thus, then, was the word of God made man. As also Moses says, God, true are his works. But if, not having been made flesh, he only did appear as a flesh, like that's the Gnostic idea, Jesus's humanity was an illusion. His work was not a true one, but what he did appear, that he also was. God recapitulated in himself the ancient formation of man that he might kill sin, deprive death of its power, and vivify man, and therefore his works are true. Very cool. This is my favorite passage in Irenaeus. And Athanasius speaks of burning away the corruption. Uh, thus he would make death to disappear from them as utterly as straw from fire. John Calvin even says this. <laughs> he didn't think I would quote from John Calvin, but he does say this. When it is asked how, after abolishing sins, Christ removed the discord between us and God and acquired a righteousness, it may be replied generally that he provided us with this by the whole course of his obedience. From the moment he put on the person of a servant, that is, became human, he began to pay the price 
of liberation for our redemption. Thank you, Calvin. Yes. In order, however, to define the manner of salvation more surely, scripture ascribes it to Christ's death as its property and attribute, yet there is no exclusion of the rest of his obedience, which he performed in his life, as Paul comprehends the whole of it from the beginning to the end, when he says in Philippians 2, he made himself of no repute, reputation, and took upon him self the form of a servant and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross nor was this without inward conflict because he had taken our infirmities and it was necessary to give this proof of his obedience to his father and it was no mean specimen of his incomparable love to us to contend with horrible fear and amid those dreadful torments to neglect all care of himself that he might promote our benefit. There was only one time that I've uh, tweeted back at the Gospel Coalition, and it's when they said Jesus, Jesus did not have like a uh, share in a, our fallen humanity. I was like, really? Because John Calvin said this. And, and if you don't, uh, if you think Jesus took on a different, like a, I don't know, pre-fallen humanity, then... I don't know. I, I think what you're saying is that Jesus ask, asks us to do things that are incredibly difficult, things that he did not do himself. So <clears throat> uh, if you want to see a Catholic wrestling with this, because Catholics have a whole different framework that they need to think through, you could look at Thomas Wynandy in the likeness of sinful flesh, where he uses the phrase sin scarred humanity. Um, and then we are a new chosen people. So when, you know, a lot of people just go to this phrase chosen people, like in Ephesians 1, as evidence of, oh, well, God chose us and not other people, right? Or God chose some to be saved and some to be damned. That is not what it means. It takes the place of, or we enter into Christ's own chosenness. He is the chosen one. And we in him, yes, are chosen people in the sense of on mission with, we, we share Christ's mission. And we are voluntarily God's covenant human partners in mission. We are God's new humanity in Christ. Notice multi-ethnic. To to, we live by God's word and hope for a happy ending. We are receiving Jesus' new humanity in our own bodies. We document the use of the cure. Israel documented the diagnosis and their hope for a cure. We have documented the use of the cure. That's the New Testament. We have received God's cure, and we are his dwelling in human persons, and we proclaim the Trinity and manifest God. And so what it, what it means to be predestined means we're predestined in the Son, and that refers to being and becoming. So there are, again, there are places where people use this phrase predestined. Yes, it's used. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that God predestined other people to not believe. It, it just means, uh, if I say, <clears throat> it just refers to we are destined in this, the location of God's willing is the Son. God already upholds us in the Son. In him, all things hold together. Colossians 1, Acts 17, Hebrews 1, 2. is probably a reflection on God's word from creation continuing to resonate and upholding all things. Our being is in the Son. When God said, let us make humanity, that statement is in the Son. It is by the Son. It is for the Son. And so the Son upholds us. And the sun is our destination, our, the, the goal of our becoming, our human becoming. Our destination has always been deeper sharing in the life of God through the word of God, or, aka the son of God. So when Paul says, all things are from him, through him, to him, which he says four times in his letters, that's really important. 
<clears throat> there's a destination like God will get us there. He's moving all things there. Christians are those who are willingly being conformed to the image of Christ in his humanity. And uh, it does not mean that the Father is coercive because God does not coerce us. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. How did Jesus love the disciples? Well, not coercively. All right. So what it means to be predestined in the Son and yet resist, d does this phrase predestined also refer to people who are not believers right now and possibly later? in eternity? Yeah, I think so. You can still be predestined in the Son. You can say, for instance, it, it sounds like this. I forgive you to someone who believes she has not done anything wrong. It's like, have you, have you ever done that? It drives people crazy. Like, I forgive you. What? I've not, but I don't need forgiveness. It says, I love you to someone who feels stalked and wants distance. Let me, it's saying, let me kill the cancer to someone who thinks his disease is normal. Or let me kill the alcoholism or give up the alcoholism to someone who says, what? This is me. Or I deny you the thing to which you're addicted to someone addicted to that thing, right? This is kind of in short, this is the, the, the message of hell is the love of God. I, I judge to separate sinfulness from the person that, but what that sounds like to someone who wants to be the judge of other people, right? Like it, it was uh, Robert F. Kennedy going to apartheid South Africa and saying, what if God is black? And, and hearing dead silence. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'd want that Jesus. See, that's, that's what it's like. But it doesn't mean that God is predestining someone to condemnation. God does not. Condemnation in Romans 5 through 8 is the mortality. It's, it's just mortality. God imposed on Adam to prevent eating from the tree of life while corrupted. So when he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus in Romans 8, 1, he means there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ because we've already died with him, right? We've been baptized and raised. We've died and risen with him. Even hell is God's love since his wrath serves his love and fire represents God's call to participate in his purification. Hell is the love of God is the thing we, is the time we talked about that. So our mission is an expression of Jesus's life and God's character. That's why Paul speaks as a missionary in Romans 9 through 11. To be missional or inviting others to respond to God's predestination of all humanity in Christ, that is an expression of God's love. So what about double predestination? Um, this is a technical term, and it, it means uh, God predestines some to salvation, others to damnation. It comes from Augustine. This is David Bentley Hart, who's an American Orthodox theologian writing in this book, uh, The Story of Christianity. Such was the force of St. Augustine's intellect that some of his ideas entered permanently into Western theology. The most obvious, perhaps, is that of predestination or double predestination. The idea that God from eternity elects some to save while reprobating the rest to damnation, which Augustine believed to be the teaching of St. Paul. Such an idea never really arose in the Eastern Christian world. The Latin word predestinare is a far stronger verb than the original Greek proorizane, which really means little more than to mark out in advance, right? It's, it's kind of the difference between, uh, I'll get you home, and how we get there, who knows? I mean, it depends on whether you need to use the bathroom, whether we want to pick anyone else up. But like, I'll get, I'll get you to the destination. Um, and Augustine did not learn enough Greek to know the difference. More importantly, Augustine's interpretations of certain passages in Paul were quite novel. All Christians believe that we're born in sin, that is, enslaved to death, suffering corruption in our bodies, minds, and desires, alienated from God. But only in the West did the idea arise that a newborn infant is somehow already guilty of transgression in God's eyes. In part, this is because the Latin text of Romans 5.12, with which Augustine was familiar, contained a mistranslation 
of the final clause of the verse, one that seemed to suggest that in Adam all sinned. The actual Greek text, however, says nothing of the sort. It says either that as a result of death, all sinned, or that because sin is general, all things die. But it does not impute guilt to those who have not yet committed any evil. In other words, do we inherit a corrupted human nature, or do we inherit the personal guilt of Adam and Eve along with that corrupted human nature? And I mean, why, why don't we inherit all of the collective guilt of every one of our ancestors? I mean, if we want to do that. So, so this idea, double predestination, it's, con it's considered hypothetically by many and, the, and just outright rejected. Irenaeus of Lyon said, but if some had been made by nature bad and others good, and he says like, well, that wouldn't make sense, <clears throat> then they wouldn't actually be responsible. It was asserted once by Lucidus of Verona in the fourth century. It was condemned as a, a heresy by the Council of Arles in 473 and by the Council of Orange in 529. Who knows? They knew that Augustine taught it, but then they denied that Augustine's uh, theology actually said it. Um, they, they did not bother to say um, how to read Augustine. They just said, don't read Augustine that way. Then in the 800s, Gottschalk, Gottschalk of Orbe taught this, and then he was condemned very quickly by councils in that region. Quirzi, Valence, Savonieris, Metz, where Pope Nicholas I was presiding too. So the, the church responds pretty quickly to this. Uh, it was considered by the early church to be not consistent with the Trinity since God's love undergirded free will itself and God is love. So we talked about that with, when we talked about Athanasius. It was actually taught by Muslim theologians. So they were influenced, for example, by Averroes, who, who retaught Aristotle to Western Europe, uh, that Aristotle believed in a prime mover, or at least you could, well, I'm not exactly, but yes, Aristotle uh, talked about mechanical causation. There was a prime mover, and the focus was on efficient mechanical causation. So if you rewind the clock, that's why I put these dominoes up here, if you rewind the clock of the universe, you would just have God tipping the first domino, and some would be saved and some would be damned. The reason why that was, uh, I guess, acceptable to some was that there was a, I think, William of Occam. He's famous for saying, talking about Occam's razor, like the simplest, um, the simplest explanation makes the most sense, is the most logical. That's, that's what Occam's razor is. He, he was an English uh, philosopher and theologian who basically said, God has no constraints of nature or character, like Trinitarian love. That's just, a, that's too complicated of an explanation. So, so, why do the, so why did leaves fall from the trees? It's not because there's a God who is rational and loving, loves his creation and established laws of nature. No, that leaf fell from the tree because God willed it. That's the simplest explanation. But if you go that route, if you apply Occam's razor like that, then what you're doing is saying, yeah, and evil also is caused directly by God. So that was not the predominant influence in the West. However, that set up Western Christianity to receive to be very impressed by the dominant Sunni understanding of God, which is God does cause leaves to fall from the tree directly. And, and so God is a, in Islam, is a naked will who can enact a predetermined narrative like the Quran, where the, yeah, I mean, that's just another facet of, of belief in, in Islam, which is the Quran has a pre-existence. Well, if that's true, then what's in the Quran? That there are unbelievers. Wait, so okay. But if there are unbelievers in the Quran, and then the Quran pre-exists actual people, and then the and then God acts in such a way to make the Quran true, 
well then, yeah, you've got double predestination. And so uh, if you want, if you want to see more of this, you could look at Rodney Stark, The Victory of Reason, and David Bentley Hart's lecture, Nihilism and Freedom, which I saved on my website. Fascinating uh, stuff. So again, William of Ockham taught God is an absolute unconstrained power, unconstrained by any nature or character. He's just power. Domingo Bañez was a, Catholic, a Spanish Dominican and scholastic who claimed to interpret Thomas Aquinas in this way. Uh, it was highly contested. And then John Calvin and Theodore Beza taught it in Geneva. There we go. It passes into the Protestant West here. And so that's why we have this impression um, when we read Romans 1 through 11 that God is arbitrary, that God is a bunch of light switches that are flat, that are on the same level. And ultimately it kind of rolls up, right? Like, well, there's this mercy switch and then there's this wrath switch and God just turns things on and off as opposed to on the right. God is loving and missional and that's that's his character. So everything flows out from there. So you could think about this. Is double predestination consistent with the nature of God as Trinity, where God's actions are character attributes, which are like light switches on a flat equal level? Okay. Uh, obviously, I don't think so. You could also think about this. Is double predestination doable in practical ministry? See, I ask these questions because if, if you are influence, I mean, I was, if you're influenced by the Lutheran and Reformed Calvinist traditions, um, supposedly, I mean, people believe in it. I, I, I doubt it, because how, how can you do practical ministry in this framework? Can you say to your non-Christian friend, God loves you, right? Or Christ died for you, or I know God loves you, or I know Christ died for you. I don't think you can say that. Um, <clears throat> because you don't know it. And is it possible that you might want their salvation more than God? Does God want to do undo all human evil, or does he require human evil to exist? Do you want social justice more than God, right? Because if God says, eh, some human evil is okay, actually the majority of human evil, it's okay, I'll just punish it at the end, even though that God loses a moral qualification to do that, well, because uh to be passively evil in the face of human evil is to be evil so how could evil judge evil it just doesn't make sense the, you you have to accept evil now <clears throat> is so god partly evil is god 100 good that's a big question does god value every person does he anchor universal human dignity uh well if double predestination is true then no he does not so one of the greatest gems of, you know, Western culture and philosophy and, and politics, human dignity, universally, it doesn't relate to that version of God. And then which justice is highest in God? Is it retributive or restorative? Also, another question to ask, if double predestination is true, then how did the earliest Christians get it wrong in two <laughs> given two things? So soon after having direct contact with the apostles, like Irenaeus is only one or two generations away. So, and they're, a, this is like supposedly a, a deep, widespread, and uniform mistake. How do they get it wrong while being so concerned to work out Trinitarian theology, which is the big theological matter, right? Can a truly Trinitarian theology conclude anything different? And so revisiting what's at stake. So all the things we looked at, <clears throat> you know, understanding God's character, how to read Romans. Did, did God just use Israel and trick them? How to interpret unbelief, how to read scripture? Well, let's, I'll quickly go through this. What about God's character? Well, we can affirm God is triune. He's 100% good. That is his nature and character. His inner triune relations existed prior to creation, therefore condition everything about him. All of his actions come from his character. And what's his character? Love. How do we read Romans? Not as an expansion of Galatians, but a mirror image. So there's a tendency in 
Protestant evangelical circles to say, you know, Galatians is the rough draft and Romans is the polished work. It's like the article versus the book. And so, you know, it, but it's not that. Uh, in Galatians, the power position is changed around. Jews are in power or Jewish Christians, and they are trying to Gentile, they're trying to Judaize the Gentile Christians. In Romans, it's the, it's the mirror image. It's the Gentile Christians who are trying to Gentileize the Jewish Christians. So we know that because Emperor Claudius kicked out all Jews from the city of Rome in 49 AD, which would have led to an all Gentile Christianity. So Paul was writing in 57 AD to call for a reinvigoration of, reconnection to Jewish Christianity, an understanding of the Sinai covenant. So Romans 1 through 8 is a defense of the Sinai covenant and God's partnership with the Jewish chosen people to prepare for the Messiah. That is cool. And then in Romans 14 and 15, you have a defense of Jewish Christianity, basically saying, they can still practice some of these things. <clears throat> so in Romans 9 through 11, we have what? We have an explanation for ongoing, loving Christian mission to Jewish folks. This is part of mission and political theology. Why, why political theology? Because uh, it is a, Paul taught respect for Mosaic Israel, which would have led to at least the question of, okay, right, we as Gentile Christians, Paul, I mean, Paul could probably foresee that Gentile Christians are going to make the majority of the church at some point. That inflection point was coming already. Maybe it already happened. It probably happened in Rome already. So Gentile Christians were going to wield power. <clears throat> Um, what would happen then? We got to respect Judaism. Well, if Christians did that, then at least they would have to ask the question, what about other beliefs? And, and at least they would raise, they would have to ask the question, right? Perhaps to the best that we can, we could respect or tolerate other faiths as well. I mean, if if, if your faith teaches you to uh, put your children to death, I'm sorry, I am going to have to oppose that with all of the democratic power available to me. But look, there, 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 at least that there is a question, uh, there is a default of, well, maybe I should have an approach of Christian political pluralism. So we can have human rights without theocracy. There is a constructive tension between, you know, th those, th the, the uh, a plurality of communities and a human rights platform that kind of cuts across all those communities. That is the constructive political task that Christians, I think, are called to. And if that was, had happened, then that might have saved Europe all of the wars of religion which was basically <laughs> fought between Catholics and Protestants. European history could have been really different if we had understood this. <clears throat> and so that's how to read Romans. Do we trust Paul's use of the Hebrew scriptures? Well, what have we seen? Paul does not prove text. He respects the literary and canonical qualities of Hebrew scripture, especially Moses and Isaiah. And Paul thinks as a Jewish theologian, he he has called, or basically he's saying Jesus is the true Israelite. He's the true Israel. He's the true David. And he's reading the Torah and Isaiah especially. How do we explain Jewish unbelief? Free choice. Now, sin is addictive, and we can impact our own human nature. That's certainly true. But, and, and perhaps even in that local sense, there's a rationale, Jewish law-keeping was an aspect of their cultural identity. And so, you know, their identity markers and boundary policing and all that, or the ethnocentrism, um, or at the time, uh, some Jews seem to have believed that to be Jewish is no longer to be a multi-ethnic faith, but a, 
a genetic descent issue. Like those Samaritans, we don't like them. So <clears throat> uh, it, it's so funny. I mean, in John 8, someone says to Jesus, like, you're, you have a demon and you're a Samaritan. And Jesus goes after the demon comment, but he's not bothered at all by the Samaritan accusation. <laughs> like he just doesn't even pay to, because he's not interested in like validating or not, not even a category for him. <clears throat> and so did God just use Israel and trick them? No. A God needed a voluntary chosen people. Be why? Because God always works with human free will to be a clinic, to receive the treatment partially, document the diagnosis, prepare the way for the cure, receive it, and love their enemies. How do we interpret unbelief in general? It's always human free choice. It is not God's choice. And how do we read, how do we read scripture? In what sense can we trust it? Well, first, God acts by speaking. He always calls forth genuine human choice by making a promise and saying, will you join me in partnership? And that produces a dynamic of human being, human becoming. And yes, there is progressive self-revelation by God climaxing in Jesus. So uh, the first Exodus to the second Exodus, for example, that is really important. It wasn't enough to come out of the authority of Pharaoh we needed to come out from the venom of the serpent. All right. Uh, I, I thought I would ask questions uh, of you guys. Do you have questions about the church's history on double predestination? Or any questions about the scriptures that we covered? If you want to ask anything else, that's fair game too. But those are some things I thought we could talk about. Ooh. That was a full two hours, wasn't it? Any any thoughts or reactions at this point? Hey, Mako. Maybe one little kind of uh thought i had was when you were talking about the double predestination and then you know how do you then how do protestants then who um like how do you even do service or how do you do ministry how do you right. do outreach and you know um that could be one conclusion right of that uh, that like all is lost because you, you know, um, you should just not even bother that <laughs> there's this, uh, you really deep down, you know, you don't seem to understand you believe in double predestination. So it doesn't matter. Don't, you know, but right. I think also there are other ways. I guess I'm more talking about um, the apologetic of that that people will have other, and there are other scriptures that will justify us, you know, um, people who do believe that, you know, in, in something like double predestination, they, they still have a mandate to, you know, go out and preach and regardless of the outcome, they have a mandate to, you know, quote, protect, yeah. um, you know, humanity to, you know, some, some way mysteriously, you know, either affect or be part of this predestination play in the mist, you know, in the universe that maybe they don't understand. Because those are things that resonate, those are things that were immediately like brought up. Um, so it's not so much a question or a thought about the, <laughs> the direct understanding of something like free will versus predestination or double predestination. It's more the um, the kind of dot, dot, dot leading conclusion that, yep. you know, why bother? Um, and there is probably a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, arguments that say, yes, bother predestination and 
bother, even though logically you're saying, you know, it won't make a difference. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, yeah, I'm. I mean, yeah. and I think your point is that well, if a person just is content to say, well, um, I do it because God told me, and whatever else God is doing, that that's none of my concern. I'll just do what God told me. Yeah. Then is that? Yeah. I mean that. Yeah, that's certainly possible. Um, I think though, what happens is that the 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 <laughs> the conviction to do that erodes over time <laughs> and um it's kind of soul it's kind of wearying on the soul um so that that's for the service part the the other part is for the proclamation it, it's for the or the explanation that we give to other people of like you know like what do we say uh, does god really love this world or does he just love the next world mm -hmm. And I think that matters also, um, because you know when when push comes to shove, ver verbally and logically, when non Christians ask us, well, but what you're what you're saying is really God loves the next world more than He loves this one, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because He doesn't love everyone in this world. So those types of things become uh, hard on our proclamation. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, you know, hmm, yeah, I'm curious to hear how maybe an apologetist like Ravi Zacharias or, you know, may have um, kind of dealt with that as well. Um, I would, yeah. I, I addressed that in the first part of the Athanasius lecture. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I actually talk about Ravi Zechariah's. And the problem with the premise of the specific point of predestination and versus free will. Yeah, yeah. Not as directly as that, but in terms of just in general, good and evil. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so uh, you, you can... You could listen to the first 10 minutes of that one. I think that's session six. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, cool. it's a good question though. <laughs> Thanks. Marco, I had a question around the hardening of heart section. Um, yes. I think this was when you were contrasting um, how God dealt with Israel versus how God dealt with Pharaoh and um, there was a bullet point. I think you said that um, because God continued to pursue Israel, um, that it was seen as like a partial hardening as opposed to like a true hardening. Um, and I was wondering if, because um, I've, I've heard different interpretations with Pharaoh's heart hardening um, being like, I don't know, I, I was just curious how Pharaoh's situation and kind of God's continued maybe opportunities to Pharaoh um, ties into, and if, if there's like parallels between the two situations there. Those are, I mean, I, th th I'm not sure, but I would speculate in this way, right? So because Paul continues to reach out to the Jewish communities of his day, and he he must be interpreting the hardening as partial in in scope or in depth so or both so otherwise i think he would give up right <laughs> like uh wait can you can you explain what you mean by um both like in scope and depth oh like scope would mean well maybe it was primarily the leaders only Right, because they were the most attached to the temple um, and, uh, and and so on and so forth. And there's a, a way in which um, that could make sense. Uh, anyway, so so in scope, meaning like how how many people exactly were affected by this hardening. Um, and then 
in depth, meaning, well, maybe the intensity, the intensity of it, like the severity of it was not as, as deep as, they, they weren't as hardened as Pharaoh was hardened. Um, mm -hmm. So, because Pharaoh's hardening of heart was pretty, pretty severe. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, uh, yeah, so either way, I don't know. Um, I, I don't feel like I have enough information to, to decide that exactly. But um, uh, in any case, I, I think what what Paul seems to be doing, though, is he seems certainly to uh, believe that, well, any given Jewish person that he runs into could come to Jesus. I mean, he it, at Corinth, he had the leaders of the synagogue come to Jesus. So... Uh, so he certainly has kind of a, a hope that is founded in, in his real experience. Uh, and so on some level, he must believe that the hardening is, is loose softened enough, or it, that maybe it, for, at least from God's perspective, it's come off, right? Like but from God's acting, it's come off because what did God want to accomplish by hardening the hearts of the, the Israelites, whoever subset of the, all Israelites. That, well, it's Jesus's exodus, right? Like his death and resurrection. Uh, and so once that was accomplished, it would seem like the hardening, God's role in it comes off. Whether there's a the underlying human hardening of hearts uh, is relinquished we don't know, but I mean, that's up to every human being, but it, it would seem to me that, that Paul must believe from God's side of it uh, that it's off, right? Like God, God accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. So mm -hmm. if I were to ask, well, when it came to Pharaoh, it would seem to me like God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart also came off after the Exodus. Right? So, I mean, Pharaoh did choose to pursue Israel and then gets swamped in the Red Sea. So, there is that. Um, but the, if that's what, what did God want to accomplish? It's, it's the deliverance of Israel out from the bondage of, of slavery. So once that was done, there, there's the point is served. So, so that's what I would think, and that's undergirded by, um, again, by how Paul seems to um, act towards the Jewish community as a whole. He has hopes. He, he's he's acting as a, a missionary would like. Yeah, I still feel called to these people. There's still a possibility that they would come to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Is he batting a thousand? No, but that, you know, that no one bats a thousand. So, so that's not the discouragement. The, the, he still operates with hope. Mm -hmm. And I've also, to that point, I've also felt like a, a lot of the way that Paul talks about things, just as kind of a general observation, is that it doesn't, seem like Paul is just going through the motions in a double predestination sort of way. Like he does genuinely believe that there is hope for um, the sort of redemption of some of these groups he's trying to reach out to and the people specifically. So um, yeah, I think that's that's a really good take on it. I hope it is. I mean, because I, I hope what I'm doing is integrating as much text as I can. Hmm. Thanks, Marco. Yep. I'm going to uh, stop sharing. Any other thoughts? Questions? I have a more like practical um, initiative question, I guess. Yes, Carter. Uh, so, in regards to the hardness of the I feel like. Um, it feels as though the, the line I have been subconsciously towing as I speak with people in um, 
as I speak with people and as I just kind of go about my everyday life, like subconsciously, it feels like the line I toe is, which I didn't realize this until you actually started talking about hardness of heart and you gave me language for it is I basically kind of tiptoe around people's hearts because I'm afraid of like saying something so like, I guess I'm afraid of hardening people's hearts with my words, but not in, not in a way of, I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd do it well because my question is how do you balance, how do you balance or how have you seen the balance the line or toe the line between like not wanting to say something that will harden someone's heart more because you know, they're not maybe in a position to say what you actually believe or what you think they need to hear, but also saying, speaking truth to them. Um, because my tendency is to not speak enough truth. Um, and I know that's not good, but I also know part of my heart is like, I know, I know part of the heart behind it is good, but I guess, how have you, like, basically, how, do, how have you found to speak to people in a way where their hearts aren't hardened as much as possible, that's within your power? That, that's a great question. Uh, I can only kind of sketch out at a, think things at a, at a high level or, or give particular examples. But, I, <clears throat> um, you know, I would say, for example, do I ever back off from the idea that human nature needs healing? No. Um, I, I will say, and, and if someone denies that, then I think they, they're putting themselves in a real bind, right? Like that either, either, so then what you're saying is you look at human beings and this is the best we can get. This is the most we can expect from ourselves. Like, I don't know. Um, or, well, what's your explanation for why do we do evil? And, you know, I <laughs> lots of people say, well, it's because of society. Well, society, well, who set up society? Well, people. So, so then which is it? Where does evil come from? That, you know, it must come from us. Um, you know, I don't think we're totally evil. Uh, I still think we're made in the image of God. We want goodness. Sometimes we do act on goodness, but the, <clears throat> but, but often we have a misguided sense of what that goodness is. And then we want to control what good and evil mean. And that's a big problem. So do I ever back down from that? No. Um, I don't think I have to make things really, really personal unless, unless they're willing to go there with me. And I, I do that with as much gentleness as I can. Um, I think when it comes to being offensive, it's, uh, I, I would just be careful. I don't want to make God sound offensive, <laughs> right? Like, uh, well, God, you know, and, and, and say callous things like <clears throat> God just caused the, the, the evil to come on you or God's the reason why, you know, someone in your family died of COVID or well, I would just never say those things that those are the things that are offensive that that pro produce in us um, th that produce in other people a desire for God not to be like that. And so if I'm talking to if that if we have that desire, then how much more non-Christians do as well? Like so. So what they're going to push back on is, no, I don't believe in your God. And they should say that they should feel that because I don't think we should believe in that God either. So, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I would just be careful to, <laughs> to say when it comes to statements about God, uh, because so many people just take the name God or the word God and, and assume that we just agree about what that means. Um, I, I'm very careful with it. I, I usually point to Jesus. I try to say Jesus is God's way of healing human nature in himself and then in us. Um, or Jesus is the only way that I know of a God who can be 100% good. And he's found a way to love the evil out of us. 
and by by being 100% loving, right? Like that to be Jesus-centered, Christ-centered, I, I think is the safest way to go. I, I hope uh, that makes sense. There, yeah. there are some, um, Carter, there are some um, example discussions that I've had uh, that I've posted online at anastasiscenterblog.org. <laughs> And I've grouped them into three human nature conversations, um, uh, character of God conversations, and good and evil conversations. And I, I think those topics can be uh, clear enough, and I can be firm enough, but still gentle. And then they kind of connect with each other. Ultimately, the, the, same, the same things apply they're just a way to start talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think I'll throw out there too, in a sort of pastoral mode, <clears throat> we tend to think a lot that the most important thing is to say the true things to other people. Yeah. Um, it's important for us to consider uh, what authority do we have to speak into another person's life? Um, and, and I feel like that authority is earned through relationship and establish patterns in our own lives. You know, a stranger doesn't just get to come up to me and speak things into my life and expect me to just accept that. Oh God, it might be true, but I don't know them. I have no idea what they intend for me. I don't know. And they have no history of walking with me through my pain and the things I struggle with versus someone like Denise, who I've known for more than half my life could probably hit me with something like that. And I go, oh, like, there's a long relationship <clears throat> here that I can trust her to want good things for me um, and a long-standing history of that. She has a lot of authority to speak into my life that way that a stranger doesn't. And I try to keep those things in mind as I'm speaking to other people about these sorts of things. That's a great point, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. One of the other um, points that I that I make in in my uh, reflections on how to share about Jesus and share our stories is um, it because when Jesus comes into our life, he retells our stories. That that requires us, at the very least, to start to get to know others, right? And and to ask good questions, open-ended questions, really of who is this person? And if we have some sense, um, some inclination of, you know, hey, I see, I see how amazing, how much more amazing you would be as a person if Jesus was in your life, then yeah, I think there's a way that you could say that gently. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully they would receive that well, if, if it's done with care and the appropriate wisdom. But the that, that is different than just saying um, uh, something like this. I don't need to really know you. I just am going to tell you stuff about Jesus. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and that's all I need to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess it's more in the context of like having friends who are Christian who I'm slowly seeing their hearts becoming hardened. And I'm like, what, what is my role as a brother in the Lord? And how do I like essentially in love confront them, but also like, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to continue. I don't want to be part of the reason why your heart is hardened, but I also don't want to just let your heart be hardened. So it's like this weird. Right. Balance. You just said um, Christians whose hearts are being hardened. They're because, hardening their own hearts. Yeah. Over what issues? Just sin issues. And then sin issues leading then to just kind of doubting God and yeah yeah uh, yeah I'll um, refer you to some things later there's a there's a sub the section of the Anastasis Center website uh, under on the topic of desire mm -hmm. and 
Uh, yeah, I mean, our desires um, and how we interact with our own desires really do influence, the, you know, the condition of our heart, our, our perception of what God is doing. So yeah, that, that's important to, to really think through. Um, so I'll, I'll, let me think about that some more and maybe I'll have something. And then a quick question. Do you have a recommendation of what translation for Irenaeus is, however, I forget how to pronounce it, if that's how you pronounce his name, uh, against heresies? Is there a translation you prefer or think is better than other ones to read? Um, no, I'm only familiar with one. So on, um, and it, the, the one I've grabbed is is from newadvent.org. I think they use um, the the big. I think they use Philip Schaff's work. Um, so Irenaeus. So if you go to newadvent.org/fathers, uh, they they will they have a partial list of um, those of of early church works that they've um, put online, which is very nice. Uh, you could find it elsewhere too, but I, I think it's, I think it all comes from Philip Schaff. Okay. Yeah. I'm not aware of other translations. I've, I've, I, I know people who've done graduate study in Irenaeus and working from like either the Armenian text of the demonstration, which is his discipleship material um, and, and kind of wrestling through the, the Latin and, uh, uh, and, and Greek of against heresies, but I th think there was a French version, uh, and I don't I don't know French. Great, thank you. So I, I'm dependent on <laughs> whoever translated, uh, worked with Philip Schaff on that one. 